Um, folks are still jumping on. Alejandro, would you like me to join in um, toward the end? Yeah, um, however you want, however you want. I mean, we're all gonna, like, I'm gonna jump in and off too. And um, and then the students are mainly gonna start introducing it. Okay, sounds good. I'll just have my video off until um, toward the end. Orale. Nice to see everybody. I too am gonna shut my video down um, because um, David is starting us off. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. We're gonna to take a few minutes to wait for more guests to, to roll in. And in the meantime, please enjoy some of the images that we'll be showing you tonight. Hopefully this will elicit some, some great memories for our panelists and give our audience a sense of Cal State LA in the 60s. Yeah, look, looks familiar. How about those faces? You recognize any of those faces? Uh, hmm. Not yet. Not yet. I don't see any yet. The hairdos, huh? Yeah. I like the hairdos. Yeah, I'm checking out the hair. Yeah. Again, thank you to all the guests who are patiently waiting. We're still waiting for more guests to continue to roll in. We'll begin shortly. Thank you. Good to see you, Smiley. I think your mic might be shut off, Smiley. Oscar. Felix, is that you? You're very accomplished. Hey, how are you doing? All right, all right. Good to see you. You, you. you haven't changed since you were <laughs> at Cal State LA. I haven't changed the kind of clothes I wear. <laughs> but I've gotten older. Yeah, but you don't look at Felix. There's Mr. Cal State LA himself in these images. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, Mr. Clean. Mr. Clean. Those are great images. We found a lot of great images of you. Well, those were good years. All right. So we're going to go ahead and start today's presentation with a small composition uh, by some of our uh, members in the Crypt Collective. So let me go ahead and, and pull that out. Again, we're really excited for today's episode and we're really happy to see many guests here today. Good to see Monte joined us. Yes, that's great. Thank you. 
Thank you so much to Cristina Cortez and Victor Orgel for that beautiful composition, which is actually the anthem to our uh, Crypt Collective, uh, also known as the Grito Series Project. So thank you all for coming today to this event. Um, my name is David Ramos, and my pronouns are he, him, el. And I'm a graduate student in the Chicana and Chicano Latino Studies Department at Cal State LA. Welcome to our first panel of the Grito series. For those that are new to the Grito series, it is a monthly virtual webinar hosted by the Crypt Collective from Cal State LA. The word Grito is an acronym for Getting Revolutionary and Intersectional Testimonials Out. We are thrilled to present a phenomenal panel of Chicana and Chicano movement trailblazers that will speak on the oral history of struggle. Drawing from both their personal testimonials and academic inquiry, today's discussion will be facilitated by two professors in the Chicana, Chicano, and Latina Latino Studies Department at Cal State LA, Dr. Alejandro Covarrubias and Dr. Rafael Solorzano. Our webinar will be broken down into three parts. First, the panelists' individual testimonials Secondly, a group discussion. And lastly, a Q&A. Feel free to type questions in the Q&A section below or raise your hand during, uh, during that time interval for a Q&A. Uh, this will be a semi-interactive inter uh, poll or, or uh, event with polls during the webinar. And we'll also have a, a post-webinar survey that will help us improve future events and your participation is much appreciated. Before we begin, we'd like to first take a moment to establish our commitment to land rematriation. Beyond land acknowledgement, we wish to collectively support any efforts led by the native caretakers of this land in the broader goal of land rematriation. We also recognize that as guests of this land, we have a responsibility to understand what physical land rematriation looks like Rematriation refers to reclaiming of ancestral remains, spirituality, culture, and resources. Land rematriation, however, refers to reclaiming stolen land and healing wounded land, wounds caused by colonialism. As members of the Cal State LA community and guests of this land, we commit to the land rematriation efforts of all Tongva peoples, the ancestral caretakers of Tovangar, the land of Pachu the land upon which we rely on today. We also wish to invite all guests of today's event to consider a commitment to land rematriation of their individual localities. Thank you. Um, so really quickly, before we begin, we wanna take a quick minute to um, do a survey, which will help us assess uh, the, our, our guests' general understanding of um, the movement and some of the, the history. So if you don't feel uh, as like you might know the answer to some of these questions, that's completely fine. We just wanted to see uh, how everyone felt. So um, please take a minute or two to fill out the survey. Please participate and engage the survey. I don't see anybody with responses yet. I'm wondering if the attendees can see the survey. I know the hosts, can, the panelists can see it, right? I can see the survey, but uh, my responses are not being recorded. Oh, there it goes. It's starting to now. Okay. One person's done. <laughs> I guess people are still reading through them. At the hmm. bottom, it says host and panelists cannot vote. Ah, I see. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. We have a couple people participating. 
now it's increasing. So thank you all for jumping on this and getting it uh, populated. We'll give you about another 30 seconds. So this too um, is designed to give our panelists a better understanding of who the audience is tonight. So we have uh, about 56% responding so far. So let's give you all a few more seconds. Pretty close to completion, 75 response rate, 75%. So I'll go ahead and end the poll so you can share the results, David. Thank you, Profe. All right, so um, hopefully you can see the results in your screen. Um, what I'm seeing here, it's pretty interesting. Uh, we have a lot of folks from East LA uh, 26%, the majority. Uh, we also have uh, this, the second biggest majority is people from South LA with 19%. Hmm. And we have a pretty good distribution across the, the LA area. We have some guests from the San Fernando Valley, a, a good 12%. Uh, and outside of LA is also 12%. And uh, most people identify within this group as Chicana, Chicano, or Chicanex with a 56 56%. Uh, 53% identify as Latina, Latino, or Latinx. Indigenous or American Indian, 12%. Black or African American, 2%. Asian or Pacific, Pacific Islander, 12%. Other, 15, uh, 14%. Pretty interesting results. And um, we, we have a, a question here that says, what year was the first Department of Chicano or Latina, Latino studies, or Mexican American studies started. Uh, most people say, I don't know, with a 58%. The second uh, largest percentage is 1964. Um, and the correct answer to this question is actually 1968, in the fall of 1968. And the next question, uh, where was the first TLS department started? We see that uh, most people got that correct uh, at Cal State LA with 51%. And what does SDS stand for? Um, the majority of people or a majority of guests, uh, which was 49% that, that they didn't know, um, but it's actually students for democratic society. So 19% of guests got that correctly. All right, and uh, we'll end this part with uh, which is better, <laughs> tortillas de maíz or tortillas de harina? Seventy-four percent of guests chose tortillas de maíz. What's the correct answer for number seven? For number seven, Masa, which started at ELAC, was the first student organization by and for students of Mexican ancestry in the U.S. Uh, Eighty-one percent said true and. 19% uh, said false. Prophet, do you know the correct answer to that one? I do know the correct answer. And I think Felix is going to uh, show us that most people have it wrong. <laughs> the correct answer is false. Uh, most people think it's true um, but, because they don't know of some of the earlier organizing by students across the country, including um, especially uh, your parents, Sam. So yes, thank you. So many of these questions. I, I also put one that I thought you all might find interesting. Um, number eight, the Communist Party never demanded rights for Chicanx, Latinx people. 58% uh, said false. So I know we'll, we'll put some, give some insight into that. And the correct answer to number nine is tortillas de maíz. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's a matter of opinion. <laughs> so thank you all for participating in that poll. Uh, now I'd like to introduce you all to Erandi Colin, who is my colleague uh, as a graduate student in the, in the CLS department as well. 
and Andy will introduce today's guest speakers. And Andy, the floor is yours. Thank you, David, and thank you so much, everyone joining us today. Uh, my name is Erandi. My pronouns are she, her, ella. And so today's special guests have made fundamental contributions to the field of Chicana OX studies and ethnic studies as we know them. In the wake of the civil rights movement, a wave of Chicana OX youth mobilized across the country and from the masses arose some of our history's most important leaders, leaders who have transformed our present through activism in the face of hatred, racism, bigotry, heterosexisms, patriarchy, ableism, and xenophobia. Today's panel of guests, of guest speakers, include key individuals in the student struggles at Cal State LA participating in groups like Students for a Democratic Society, United Mexican American Students, Movimiento Estudiantil Chicano A de Atzlan, Young Chicanos for Community Action, and others. However, today we ask them to not only speak about their involvement during the movement era of the 60s and 70s, but we ask them to share in what ways their family's participation in earlier organizing efforts motivated their own consciousness development. In the spirit of recognizing the continuity of struggle between earlier generations and the Chicana and Chicano generation, we learn about experiences of migrating workers, labor or organizers, and student organizing projects on multiple campuses. Now, it gives me immeasurable pleasure to introduce the following elders. Oscar J. Martinez, Teresa del Carmen Gonzalez, AKA Little Red Terry, Ismael Smiley Parra, and Felix Gutierrez. Sorry, um, I would like to now pass it on to our amazing Grito Series Chair, Prof. Uh, Dr. Alejandro Covarrubias. Okay, thank you all so much. We appreciate you uh, participating tonight. As mentioned by Randy earlier, we're gonna break this down into um, different sections, different portions so that we can have both um, the direct uh, responses to the audience as well as initial introduction of each of our panelists. Um, we've also developed some questions that are general questions um, and questions that are specific to each person. Uh, to start off, what we'll do is we're going to go ahead and, and um, uh, uh, well, before, when you start talking, we'll share your profile as well as some images that we collected about you. Um, in this first portion of the evening, we're gonna ask our participants to share their own testimonials as organizers, okay? So they'll, sh they'll use the following questions to respond with their eight to 10 minute story. We know that that's a short amount of time, but this is so that we can get into um, some more general discussion about the history of um, Chicano studies, and not just Chicano studies during, during the movement era, but pre and post the movement era. So first, these are the questions. I put them in the in the chat for you. Tell us who you are and those things that made you the organizer you became. For instance, where were you born and how did you grow up? Or were there key motivations for your participation? In which group or activities did you, did you specifically participate during the movimiento and what was your role? Okay. And number three, how would you like for people to remember the Chicano movement era within the wider context of human struggles for justice? So. I'll go ahead and start us off with um, Teresa Gonzalez. Uh, Terry, if you might um, take a stab at some of these questions and, and some of these we'll, we'll return to, but um, this is just to get everybody a better understanding of who, who you are, your role and, and how you see the movement. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me to this panel. I feel honored. Thank you very much. Um, 
well, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, California. This is home for me. My family is originally from Tejas, border town of Del Rio. And uh, there they suffered a lot of discrimination. So they knew what it was like to be um, considered a second class citizen, especially because they were American born citizens, but because they were Mexicano, Spanish culture, they were treated differently. And um, uh, the political part of my family began with my maternal grandfather who made sure that all the Mexicanos, all the um, Latinos in Del Rio went out and voted. First of all, that they paid their poll tax and then they went out to vote. And he also encouraged them if there was a Mexicano running for office to vote for them. The uh, second person was both my parents. My mother brought us up uh, bilingual, bicultural, biliterate. She never, um, she always reminded us who we were. And uh, my father was a um, organizer or not an organizer, but he was a participant in the organization and the coming of age of the unions. And he knew what it was like to work without a union job. So he was a labor person. He was a union man. He supported the unions and he taught us to always make sure we had a job that had a union and to always um, support the union because we, they were the ones that fought for your benefits as, as, as well. And um, make sure that you had equal pay, that you had uh, retirement benefits, that you had health benefits, et cetera. Uh, so that's for that. Let me go back to the question so I can. Um, so that really influenced me. Now, the other person that influenced me as well was one of my brothers. He was, um, he was a Navy man, but he became uh, very involved politically after he came out of the uh, Navy. Uh, he saw a lot of injustices there, and he, especially against the uh, Ch uh, Chicano uh, veterans. So he used to have a ham radio and I must have been about eight, nine, 10 years old. And he would be listening at night to someone that was giving these speeches, elaborate speeches and just going on and on. So I asked him, who's that man that's talking? And he told me, well, that's Fidel Castro. He's in Cuba and he's talking from the Sierra Maestra and he's trying to organize the Cubanos because um, you know, they don't even have the right to go to their own beaches call, but because all these hotels are on the beaches and all these rich people go there and they work there, but they can't even go on their own beaches. And plus they're, they're treated very badly. They've got bad housing, they're underpaid, they're discriminated against. So I really used to sit there and listen to Fidel Castro broadcasting from the Sierra Maestro with my brother. And I was in fact, one of the greatest memories I have about that is remembering when Castro entered Havana because I got to hear that live. And that was um, very impressive to me. But you know, that at that time, I just took it as, okay, he's just another man on the radio. It wasn't until I was about 13 and I was in high school and that's when Kennedy ran for president. And my family were Democrats. Prior to that, we had had Republican um, president so I wasn't involved too much in campaigns but I did get involved in the campaign for um, Kennedy and have stayed involved in in endorsing different candidates um, since then uh, so all of this was my foundation to get involved when I started college it was the second year I was in college that there was a civil rights movement going on and Chicanos were really barely starting to go to East LA College. There wasn't that many of them, but the class of 66, in fall of 66, fall of 67, more brown faces were coming on campus. So we decided that we needed to have a voice because we knew of all the injustices going on in the community. So we organized La Vida Nueva, which was a student organization and we would write articles and submit them to the campus paper and they would not print them. So we solicited, went from the student body, we went to their meetings and we asked them if we could have our own paper, La Vida Nueva newspaper, which we did. And we would have to work um, after hours. So that means that we would not get into to the office until about six or seven 
and we work all night to put out the paper. Hmm. We also, uh, so we got that done. The second thing we petitioned for was that we wanted to use some student body funds if they could, I think we got like $50 to put on an event for Cinco de Mayo. So we had a Cinco de Mayo. We got permission to do that. So then we figured, oh, we need music. We need entertainment. We all brought food to sell. And at that time, Folklorico, Ballet Folklorico was not that popular, but we did find some senior citizens at one of the senior citizen centers out in Boyle Heights or East LA that said, yes, we'd love to dance for Cinco de Mayo. And they came and were all dressed up. They even brought the musicians with them. They go, we've got musicians too. So we were able to have a, 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 the first Cinco de Mayo at uh, East LA College. Also at that time, I was at Students in Democratic Society because prior to La Vida Nueva, that was the only political organization going on. And their main um, goal was, was to um, stop the war in Vietnam, bring our soldiers back. But they had workshops where they taught you how to organize, what to do at demonstrations, how to, you know, signs, making signs, running off pamphlets. So I got a lot of training there as far as, um, you know, hands-on types of things to do. Um, also, they were, um, they did a lot of, they, they had a big Marxist-Leninist following. They weren't exactly communists, but they were progressive people. And there was many people that in that group that were communists. So we did have workshops on Marxist-Leninism that I also joined in. And that was sort of a, our foundation for, um, for our group. From East LA College, I went to, uh, I graduated, I went to Cal State LA. And there, United Mexican American Students, UMAS was transferring, was beginning to do the name change to Mecha. And so um, I was there when it became Mecha. And as I had mentioned to you, one of the students, Ralph Ibero, <clears throat> excuse me, was one of the students that designed the emblem that was adopted by all the campuses. So from there, we, um, we organized different things. We looked at community events that were going on, participated in them. We also were in, um, in, in alignment with the other campuses and joined them whenever they had demonstrations or protests. We, um, then there was one year for student body elections. We ran a multicultural um, slate. We joined with the Black Student Union, the Asian students, the American Indian Movement, and ourselves. And we ran candidates in different um, offices, and we did win. So we had our slate was voted in. So that was a, a big plus for us. Um, from, we also were one of the uh, main schools that participated in the uh, Chicano Moratorium in 1970 organizing for that. And um, from there, everybody that, most of the people that graduated with me and were involved with me stayed organizing in, in different areas. Some organized is, as attorneys, so they fought for social justices for um, people that were incarcerated. Many of us became teachers and we were advocates for bilingual education. Um, other people went into the um, law enforcement field, but not so much as, as uh, police officers, but more as parole and probation officers to again, assist those that had been incarcerated when they would be out, when they got out of jail, how to um, get back into society, help them find jobs, help them find housing, et cetera. So that's, that's my, my spill for, to, for right now. Thank you, Teresa. Yeah, you've shared so much and it looks like your, your specific uh, motivations didn't just come from your home. They seem like you had in international inspiration from folks like Fidel, which kind of reminded me how organizers in LA in the 90s would be waiting for the communications that were coming out from Subcomandante Marcos. It sounds like your generation was listening to Fidel to see kind of what the next things that were happening internationally. So, and, and I've heard that quite a bit. So thanks for sharing that. Um, now uh, I'll go ahead and ask um, Oscar Martinez, uh, Dr. Oscar Martinez, if you could share a little bit of your response to these same questions, um, which 
I could once again put in the chat so you could review them. But essentially, it's about you sharing um, your own motivations for getting involved in, in, in organizing during your um, era. But also, what, what were the things that were happening before that uh, served as inspirations for you? Um, yeah, you could share. Sure. First, uh, thank you, Alejandro, for organizing this and all the work that you've been doing. It's uh, really nice uh, to be a participant uh, in, in, this, uh, in this event. Um, I, I come from a family uh, that went back from Mexico to the United States, going back to the 19th century. Uh, we're transnational borderlanders. And, and, and so um, I was uh, born in Mexico at a time when the family had, uh, had gone to Mexico. And I was born in San Francisco, the Loro Chihuahua, which is a mining town. <clears throat> my father was, uh, was a miner and my mother was a community uh, teacher. And um, it was my mother who uh, most uh, influenced me in, 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 in the way that uh, I began to <clears throat> adopt uh, progressive values and, and saw the need to uh, engage in, in community activities. My, my, my mother was recruited by the Lazaro Cardenas uh, government education bureaucrats back in the, in the 1930s uh, when they had uh, this uh, program in socialist education. And, and uh, Lazaro Cardenas uh, educators at the national level saw a great need to recruit uh, young women and young men, but mostly young women for the program that my mother was in um, to, to become community teachers uh, after she did her uh, elementary school, which uh, was uh, six years. Um, she, she then joined a bunch of other young people in the state of Chihuahua, and they were taken to a, uh, an hacienda that had been expropriated from the Terrazas family. The, the, the Terrazas, Luis Terrazas was, a, was the oligarch in, in Chihuahua. Um, and and he, was, um, he was the target of the revolutionaries during the Mexican revolution. And so my mother uh, in the 1930s is part of this uh, group of young women who is uh, taken to this uh, expropriated hacienda that's, that has been converted into a teacher's college. Now, this is not like going to a university because my mother just had a sixth grade education and everybody else there, they had a sixth grade education, but they were good students. And so they, they had skills or, or the educators who recruited them thought they had enough skills to become teachers. She was there for four years. And then after they graduated, um, then they were assigned to go to rural communities and teach the campesinos how to read and write basically and also teach them about their, their rights. And, and this is during the time um, when uh, the Hacendados in Mexico were still uh, very powerful and, and they had a tremendous amount of control in these uh, rural communities. And so uh, this was actually dangerous work that my mother was, was in because it was, only not, it was not only teaching campesinos how to read and write, but also teach them about uh, their rights as, as, as workers and, and that the, the, the Hacendado didn't need to have all that power that they had power if they united themselves. Um, and so these teachers were seen as a threat. And in fact, some of my mother's uh, colleagues uh, actually were, um, were attacked in some of their communities and some of them were killed by these right-wing uh, hacendados because of the threat that they posed to, um, to, to the power structure that existed in Mexico and the state of Chihuahua. And so I learned uh, all about that by conducting an oral history uh, interview with my mother 
And in addition to that, my mother, who liked to write, wrote out her story. And so she included a lot of details about her experiences during those years. And so I, I was deeply affected uh, by her commitment to, to help the poor, to help educate the campesinos and campesinas in these rural areas. And, and then my father was, um, was a miner. And, and so uh, he, he, he uh, really was not involved in, in labor activities, but he had these strong feelings about the power structure that um, kept the uh, industrial workers uh, down in Mexico and, and the wages, the very low wages that they paid in Mexico. And as a consequence of that, my father decided, well, we better head to the United States where wages are better. And eventually we did. For some time, my family uh, was in the US illegally and we got deported. We got kicked out uh, one year in the early 50s and uh, had to uh, stay out of the US for a year. But after a year, we were allowed to come back. And eventually we we're able to become a uh, permanent uh, residence and eventually um, many in the family became uh, US citizens. So my inspiration essentially came from my mother who was a real activist in, 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 in the, the uh, rural communities in, in Mexico, but also in Ciudad Juarez. When we lived in Ciudad Juarez, she really got involved in local stuff, primarily in education. So fast forward to uh, when I graduated from high school, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you from El Paso, and I, this is my hometown. And I retired <clears throat> here in El Paso three years ago. I made El Paso my permanent, permanent home after teaching at the University of Arizona for 30 years. So anyway, after high school, I went to the army for uh, a couple of years. I, I worked to help out with family expenses for a couple of years, and then wound up at Cal State LA where I met great people like Felix Gutierrez and Monte Perez and, and Maria Baeza uh, and um, many others. Uh, and, and I don't remember exactly how I um, became involved in UMAS, United Mexican American Students, but, but I saw the activism that was going on on campus and, and this group of Chicanos and Chicanas uh, that were in, involved in, in this movement, uh, really, um, these, were, these were my people. These were the people I could identify with. <clears throat> and so I joined and, and um, participated in, in many of, of the activities, including the blowouts that happened in 1968. Um, the, the, the event that uh, I remember the most is when I organized um, or I was uh, selected as the head of the committee that organized this uh, community day on campus back in 1968. And we had Luis Valdez and uh, El Teatro Campesino come to the campus. And the whole idea was to attract a lot of young Chicanos and Chicanas from East LA to come to Cal State LA and get the feel for the university and, and encourage them to um, you know, want to come uh, to Cal State LA at the same time, we were working hard uh, with um, the administration there at Cal State LA, and Felix and his wife Ma Maria were uh, very, very helpful in facilitating a lot of these meetings that we had with administrators at Cal State LA to, um, you know, get more resources to support the Mecha activities. Well, we call ourselves UMAS, and then the name was changed to, to Mecha in 1969, and 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 so. The, the, those were my roots and, and uh, the folks who inspired me. I was great, greatly inspired by my compañeros and compañeras at uh, Cal State LA and, and also the people who were in other organizations like the Black Students Union, the Students for a Democratic Society. I went to East LA for a while and met some of the folks um, that uh, were active with MASA at East LA uh, College. And I graduated from Cal State LA in 1969 and went on to do graduate work in, um, in, in, at Stanford in Latin American studies, history of Mexico, and history of the, uh, the US-Mexico border. 
So I've devoted most of my academic career uh, teaching about Mexico and the, and, and, and the borderlands and, and writing books. But at the same time, I never stopped my activism in the community. I was always uh, very interested in, in continuing to do that. Now that I'm retired, I'm trying to raise some hell along with other activists here in El Paso through an organization that we founded called the Community First Coalition and also through another organization that I helped to uh, found uh, the Social Justice Education Project. What we're doing is challenging the political and economic power of some local oligarchs, super rich people who control a lot of the politics and certainly the economy of El Paso. And uh, it's a real challenge and that's what I'm involved in now. Gracias, Oscar, so much you shared. Um, first, um, I think the, the, the part that you shared about how, how important our stories are and how you learn so much from, from the oral histories of your family. Um, and, and as I'm hearing your story, it reminds me of other elders who have shared their stories and we could see direct connections to public policy against the Mexicans. For example, in the 50s, as you mentioned, uh, when people were being deported, um, particularly uh, people of Mexican ancestry, many of the citizens. Um, and so thank you. Um, and I often remind my students how important it is for us to collect these stories because um, they're not always written. Sometimes we, we have to find them, right? I did want to also point out that um, you highlighted some really important figures, some of them who aren't on here now, but there are some that are here. So Monte Perez, uh, who was also one of the key organizers of Pumas on at Cal State, is, is in the audience right now, as is Vicky Castro. Um, Vicky's on too. In fact, Vicky has her hand raised. So uh, we're going to we're going to hold on in the questions until later. But I think um, since it's Vicky, we 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 need to allow Vicky to ask your question real quick because it might it might be something that that. Um, may take us uh, to discuss some other issues that, that are equally important. Vicky, if you're on, I hope you could um, jump in and, and hopefully share your question. I, am I on? Yes, you are. No, I, I raised my hand just to say hi to everybody there. <laughs> I haven't seen many of you for a long time. So don't let me uh, interrupt here. Hi, Vicky. Hi. Hey, good to hear from you. I want to see you. Put your put your video on. I, I, I'm figuring it out. I'm figuring Hi. it out. Okay. okay there, there you go. Are. There you are. <laughs> Senior Sorry. citizen moment. <laughs> Vicky is one of the other um, 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 foremothers of our of our program and and really foundational in so many ways, including a key organizer in uh, the blowouts and, um, and participant. Really, I, I saw you much as a link um, for community and the campus spaces as, as many students were doing organizing on campus. Um, you were doing a lot of organizing in, in the community, which uh, at this point, that's a great segue to my next, um, next person we're going to introduce, which is Ismael Smiley Parra, who is there on the bottom left also part of Young Citizens or Young Chicanos for Community Action, which is the, the precursor to, um, to the Brown Berets. So um, Ismael, if you could also please share your own um, story of what motivated you to get involved in, in the Movimiento and um, uh, what specifically did you, did you have a role in? Ismael, are you there? I, are you frozen? No, he, he... Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. There you go. Okay. Um, well, uh, activism was part of my family for generations, uh, starting with, as far as I know, my grandparents and, and my parents. Uh, I'm a red diaper baby two times because my, my grandparents uh, were in the Communist Party. And so were my parents. And uh, so activism was sort of a natural part of uh, what we were doing. And um, 
it goes back to you know discrimination that was uh you know before the uh, the uh, first uh, second world war uh the time uh that uh my dad i remember told me he used to fight almost every single day <laughs> uh on his way to school when he was in imperial imperial valley uh based solely on the fact that he was a uh, mexicano going to school uh he was born in uh, ajo arizona and uh my grandfather used to uh on my father's side used to move cattle in order to feed uh the workers either mine workers or railroad workers he was a uh, uh cowboy and my uh, and on the other side the other grandfather was a steel worker and he was uh you know eventually uh banned from uh here bethlehem steel because uh he was organizing the union and he was organizing the union uh because it was needed and also because he wanted uh more latinos to be represented and have the rights that white workers had, uh, because even inside of the union, there was a struggle uh, to overcome the the uh, discrimination. Uh, uh, in fact, it was it was a it was a communist who first uh, immigrated the printers' union here in Los Angeles, a man by the name of O'Neill Cannon, and uh, he and my father and my mom were. Uh, on a picket line, when I was in their arms, I was just a baby in order to integrate the first bank in Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, they brought together, you know, Latinos and Blacks uh, in uh, Watts. And they said, uh, we told people, don't bank, or you can't do other than just clean the floors in the business that you're in. In this case, it was the bank. And eventually, uh, they won that struggle, and they hired tellers uh, that were Mexican and uh, black. So that struggle, you know, that sort of was sort of passed on. And then in high school, uh, well, there was there are pictures there. Those are the one on the right. There is one uh, at the uh, a union meeting for uh, United Teachers Los Angeles, the Chicano Education Committee. And in the middle was an anti-war demonstration, and that's me playing up there. I'm a songwriter and a musician. And on the left, uh, that's me as a uh, mariachi at Cal State LA, uh, because we formed the first mariachi, and I was instrumental in carrying that forward, because culture is a very, very important part of the advancement of struggles and for equity. And that's why they tried to deny it to us in. Uh, in so many ways, you know, in, a couple of years ago in, in, in Arizona, they even tried to ban, you know, books on, uh, on uh, in the Chicano studies uh, genre. So uh, that's where the activism came from, you know. Um, in, in high school, I was involved, in, even in junior high school, actually, I was involved in, you know, the Kennedy uh, uh, campaign um, and just before that you know my parents were very involved in the first attempt by Roy Bal to get the first Chicano on the city council that was all white and that was a, uh, a program that was taken up by the, the Communist Party as a key to uh, begin to Con uh, combat the racism that was happening in our Chicano community, which was suffering greatly from that. Uh, all of us have been touched by it in one way or another by the racism. My, one of my uncles was shot in the back by the police uh, and killed. So, um, and it was this that, this that uh, brought me sort of as a natural uh, way to go and fight and like terry uh was mentioning uh you know i remember my dad listening to the radio and also listening to a uh, broadcast from uh from uh, mexico and also from cuba and also reading uh, 
a book called Bohemia, uh, no, a magazine Bohemia, which had really good articles, which is a, a book, a magazine from Mexico, uh, which is where I learned some of my Spanish, reading in Spanish. It was, it was a hard, <laughs> uh, difficult. Um, and uh, let me see, some of the other things, um, I don't know. Uh, I guess that was, you know, the activism that led into, you know, the campaigns for, for equity. You know, we wanted people that look like us to be represented, whether it was in the unions or whether it was in civil society as elected representatives. The other day we went to a celebration of the Chicano uh, moratorium. Uh, and at that celebration, some people were saying, oh man, how, you know, what are you doing? Because I was, I was I was wearing one of these things on here. All right, and uh, the uh, and he said, "Oh man, he's still you know fooling around with that." And, this. and I told him, "You know the thing that we learned in in the Communist Party is you got to be where the where the majority of workers are, and the majority of workers, and especially uh, minorities, blacks and, and Latinos, are in the Democratic Party." So that's where we work, you know. That's what that's what we want. That's where we want to move people. You move first the ones that are close to you or want a dialogue, and then you reach out and even to the ones that uh, don't. Uh, and uh, there's many ways to do that, you know, through our unions, through community organizations. Uh, Val, for example, uh, was the one of the founders of the CSO, the Community Service Organization. In fact, he was their first president. And he was also a founder of MAPA, the Mexican American Political Association, which was founded in Fresno, I think, uh, in 1960. So these organizations, by 150 people, these organizations are the ones that were trying to correct, you know, the uh, racism uh, that made for there having to be black uh, regiments in the Second World War, which is ridiculous. Uh, and the Vietnam War, of course, uh, the Chicano Moratorium was a protest to that. It was the largest demonstration to date in the Chicano community uh, against uh, the war in Vietnam. And uh, I remember speaking to a, a white comrade and he said, you know what? I was on the East Coast, and when we heard about this group of Mexican people protesting the war, it really gave them an impetus to consider these were people that were in SDS and so forth. Says, man, we didn't know that that they were that they would uh, they were doing these kind of things. Well, they didn't know because you know the media never covered us, um, and we're still fighting fighting that battle. Um, and after, you know, Breval went on to become a, 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 a city councilman in more than one term, and then he you know, went on to Congress. And, and I was telling this person at the Chicano Moratorium, I said, look, I remember when there were no representatives or almost zero. And now we have, you know, elected assembly people, the Congress, to the Senate, um, in, in almost all areas. And uh, one of the people on here, Vicky Castro, was on the Board of Education, you know, before her, and she was in the, on that camp campaign for NAVA. So progress has been made. And of course, you know, there are there are setbacks all the time as well. Uh, but we, you know, we work on those and we continue to, to move forward. Uh, the the uh, Occupy Now, uh, the Bernie campaign, those things have been uh, like a, a coalescing of people and it's brought people together. Uh, I was a teacher at, at uh, Cal State in the Chicano uh, Studies Department. I taught there and uh, was there when at, at the first, uh, second year we it was going. I, I started, uh, I think, the Chicano Studies there at second year in 69. I started and went through that and then went through uh, Latin American Studies and, and moved on to other, other education. Uh, I missed a, a long part of uh, 
participation here because I was uh, I was away for 20 years and so uh, missed a lot of what was happening here in Southern California, even if I was still active other places. I think I'll just stop there. Thank you, Smiley. And one of the themes that I feel like I keep hearing from all of you is, is um, the Chicano movement as a workers movement. So I'm sure that we'll come back to that. Um, Felix, if we could turn to you and have you um, share a little bit of uh, your own inspiration. And also, I want to remind you to think also, how would you like the, the Chico movement era to be remembered um, within the wider context of, of just human struggles for justice? Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro. Can you hear me OK? Yes, okay. absolutely. They just told me to unmute, so I did. Um, I want to thank you and the organizers, first of all, for what you are doing. I entered Cal State LA 60 years ago, uh, this, this month. And I remember looking for something on the campus that reflected who I was as a Mexican American, the term we used in polite company in those days. And uh, there was no, nothing. I mean, there was a, um, a Christmas party that the women students gave at Glen Elta, the elementary school in uh, East LA, Happy Valley, where I'd gone to school. And they, it was a charity thing, but it was nice. But it was a once a year thing. And then they had one class, uh, Louis de Arman professor taught it uh, uh, on the history of Mexico. So I said part of my sights was I'm gonna take that class. I wasn't gonna be a history major, I was gonna be social studies. But if I take enough uh, history classes, then I can uh, uh, qualify when I'm a senior uh, to take uh, the history of Mexico. And that was what was the closest thing to Chicano studies in those days. And now looking 60 years later, the things a lot of us were part of getting going in the late 60s and what you have done and what you have built upon is very, very uh, inspirational to me and to a lot of people that you don't feel like you're uh, an alien on your own campus your own alma mater that is located in your own community. You know, this was really an extension of uh, the white society into our community and the administration, and the faculty, the campus, the student body was predominantly white in those days. They weren't anti-Mexican. They just didn't know much about us or appreciate what we brought to campus. And they were, uh, you know, helpful to us in an integration way to show us how whites uh, did things. I did well at Cal State LA. Uh, was uh, editor of the school paper, and then uh, later elected uh, student body president. And I think this was uh, oh, in the corner there, you see when we were elected in 1964, three Chicanos ran for office, we didn't run as a team, but uh, we all got elected. I was the editor, so I made the headline in bold red, Ole, Puerta Gutierrez Carrasco triumph, as a signal that you know we, we had a presence on this campus in a leadership role. The woman's president the year before Associated Women's was Marianne Gonzalez. So you team us together, you had four of the top student body offices were held by Mexican Americans. Um, again, running as individuals, but doing things that related to our community. My inspiration came from my grandparents and my parents, the role models and my parents. On my mother's side, my grandfather and my grandmother, uh, were a pastoral cap couple, first in Mexico and then in the United States in 1918 for the Methodist Church, pastoring to uh, churches and communities in Spanish in Texas, uh, starting in 1918, then Arizona in the 1920s and 30s and 40s, and in California in the very, very early 50s. They uh, put a great value on education. All of their seven children went to college in the, in some of the, <laughs> five of them during the depression, which is very uh, hard to do and were active, those five in organizing what I think was the first campus-based uh, Mexican-American student organization, the uh, Conquistadores, which was founded at Arizona State in 1937, uh, four of my, my mother and four of our, or four siblings or three siblings and my mother 
were all members. My mother was the first uh, woman listed as a member when they listed that, uh, and her two, two of her sisters were, were right after her. Um, so there were a community service, religiously based, but it was, you know, work with Anglos, work with Mexicans, work with your own people and fit their needs as uh, the churches did. The churches were very socially active in those days in the service and education and such. On my father's side, my, uh, we're Californios. We were here when this was part of Mexico and uh, fought against the US, uh, you know, when, the, when they invaded. My dad used to say, we were here, the Anglos came, we welcomed them. And then they turned against us in kind of a quizzical way. You know, okay, what do we do? Why did they turn against us? In the San Gabriel Valley and uh, where we've lived uh, since the 1840s, 1830s. My grandfather uh, was born in 1871 and uh, adapted by retaining his culture and his identity, but also to the Anglo society. His name was Francisco, but he went by Frank. He was a uh, politically active, was deputy constable in Azusa, California in the 1890s, was the only uh, Spanish surname I saw in 1902 that was in the uh, state uh, political convention for the Democratic Party or Southern California Democratic Party. And he started a business as a, a cement contractor in Monrovia. And so he was a businessman. He was active politically and he, uh, he raised a family. He was married twice. Uh, his first wife and his second wife both passed away due to illness. So for many years, he was a, or for several years, he was a single father, a single parent, raising his sons, two sons, uh, one of which was my father. My dad grew up in Monrovia, went to Pasadena Junior College, which is now PCC. And while he was there, worked with the YMCA group called the Mexican Youth Conference and was the founding editor of their magazine, The Mexican Voice, which was founded when he was a teenager in 1938. And the power of media was to spread the word of what was doing. Bert Corona, who some of you know, taught at Cal State LA, as a number of other things, was the feature editor when my dad uh, founded the magazine. And it reported on activities that you didn't see in the other media. You know, it would have accomplishments, kids going to college, people getting jobs, uh, community activism stuff. They, uh, they were very much, uh, uh, you know, we can do things, we can get ahead. Don't let somebody put you down. And that was uh, their model. So that was you know, what they did. And uh, they met my mom at Arizona State, my dad at uh, PCC, met as a Mexican-American college student activists, uh, something that, uh, that brought them together, a shared commitment. They both went on to become teachers in the East LA schools. My mother in the 1940s, I still remember as I was about three years old visiting her at uh, what was then Brooklyn Avenue School and looking at her classroom and wondering, oh, what's it like to go to school? What's it like to be here? I was about three, three years old. My dad taught at Kern, which is now Griffith uh, Junior High and uh, taught art there and also worked at the YMCA after the Zoot Suit Riots in 1943 uh, with gangs, not to break them down, which is some of the later strategies, but to build them and involve them in other activities, sports, camping, having teams. So it, or they have the, you look at the teams, you know, and they're white fits and they're these other Utah, these are, well, those were the gangs, but you know, they got them in the Y and some of them got to do to those activities. So those were my role models. Um, my cousins, because my mom's siblings had gone to college. We all knew growing up in the 1950s, we were gonna go to college very different than, uh, than most uh, Chicanos. And we lived, my mom taught at Glen Elta in uh, Happy Valley. And we lived in Lincoln Heights, right around the corner. I remember in the 68 walkouts, I said, we want teachers who live in the community or part of the community. And all I said, well, yeah, that's what we were doing in the, in the 1950s when we, were, when we were there. I went to the school where my mother taught and so did my sister. My, um, Activities in the Movimiento 
beyond individual achievement came when I returned to Cal State LA from getting a master's at Northwestern in journalism in 1967. And this new organization, Monte Perez and Phil Castrida and others that put together, UMAS needed a place to meet. They weren't a legal chartered organization. So I was an administrator working with the EPIC program, which I had helped start uh, earlier. And uh, I said, well, Al, you know, I can get you a room. So that's all you need. So we did. I remember Vicky Castro was there uh, as one of the early members in the summer of 67. Lillian Roybal was also a member. Uh, Antonio Rodriguez used to come in the meetings. You know, we met at just a small conference room. There couldn't have been more than 10 or 12 of us. And I saw what the group and this inspiration was of what they were doing. And for me, it meant that achievement was not an individual endeavor. That's what I had done. You know, I had, I had achieved, I'd made it in this white society, but I knew there were a lot of people like me, just as good as me that weren't getting that opportunity. Their parents hadn't gone to college. They, uh, after my dad died, we moved to South Pasadena. They had not gone to a white school. We moved from Lincoln Heights to South Pasadena. And uh, I said, no, you know, we need collective action. And this is a group, a very energetic, very ambitious group of people. So I, I threw myself into that. I, it was a connection. I knew people on campus. I knew how to get posters made, how to reserve rooms, how to get audiovisual, how to reserve the um, free speech area and all that. So I was a little bit older, but not a lot older than the students that we're working with. And, and a lot of the stuff you see there started as student demands that are there uh, that are there today. Uh, my main activity individually was with the media. I was frustrated that I had not been able to get a job with a master's degree in journalism from Northwestern. And so I went to work with La Raza when it was just getting started in 1967 with Risco out of the Epiphany Church. And it did media relations for protests, pickets, marches, demonstrations to get reporters to cover what we were doing. We had a saying then that the journalists, the reporters got into the barrio right after the police. And that was kind of the way, the way things went. Um, we would get stories covered, but more often they would cover what we did, the protests, the marching, the yelling and you know, things like that, more than the reason we were having those protests, what we were trying to achieve. And, and none of, I never had any Chicano reporters come to any event because there weren't any. Ruben Salazar was at the Times at there, but he was in Mexico City. And so it was an education every time I had a reporter to get them to know East LA, where they were. They'd get their story, they'd get out and they'd move on. Some of them were good and would come back like Jack Jones or the LA Times, but most of them, it was just a, a one day story. And I uh, committed myself to that, went on to Stanford, as an administrator, when I realized I wasn't gonna get a job in journalism and became a journalism professor, first at Cal State Northridge, journalism and Chicano studies, and um, then at USC uh, in 1979. And stayed very active in advocating for better opportunities and for hiring. And the people you see on the media today are not like the male and pale media that I grew up with on TV and in newspapers. We've always had people with talent. They just haven't had the opportunities to show what they could do with their talent. Thank you very much. That's right. Thank you. Wow, that was so so powerful. So much there. Uh, I wanted to comment on so much, but but I will focus just on one thing. This activist love that you shared um, um, that your parents developed across from Arizona to PCC, and um, it sounds like you and Maria Elena continue the tradition because both of you kind of met as activists and 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 we're both really like a power couple that that really influenced and 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 helped out many of the students i know you all were both you were you were young but you were an administrator and so was um maria elena and so um you you truly are key figures that that um often people don't center and so i, I appreciate you being here today well the credit goes to the students who made things happen because you absolutely, can, you absolutely. Can do that. Yeah, that's where and Oscar and and Vicky and Monte and others who are here with us, uh, you know, it's they would. I could show them how to reserve a room 
but you know, they didn't need any script to, to decide what to say. Uh, and we had big events. Ralf Guzman was the other advisor and he knew everybody. Our first two event we had at the free speech area in October 67 was Corey Gonzalez and Reyes Lopez Tijerina. So you start with those two as your lead off uh, public event people, you know, you got something going. You're gonna get people to, to rally around the flag and the students organized it. Yeah, and, and, and those two were really um, powerful, um, charismatic speakers that, that people that really can, can get a, a crowd going. And it sounds like um, the students really resonated with the message that they were um, sharing with uh, land and liberty, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I want to shift to asking um, more general questions now that any of you can answer, including Vicky, since you're on. Um, are there earlier or contemporary forgotten struggles or movements or people that you feel haven't been given enough attention? So, so you know how we all think about the Chicano movement as this period between the 60s and the 70s so that everybody tends to think of uh, the Chicano movement era as a start and ending point, right? Um, I, I like to think of it of a of a continuity, just like you all have demonstrated um, from your own family struggles, and then even just knowing some of your children, uh, how they continued the struggle themselves in, in, in their own unique way for this generation. Yeah, Alejandro, I'd like to comment on that. I think, you know, as uh, Felix was saying, you know, his family, they were, they all went to college. And um, I think when you look at the undocumented, many of their children were not going to college. They were going to work. Mm -hmm. But I think us as elders, we motivated those, that group of people to, you know what, well, we have to start sending our kids to college because that's how we're gonna, how we're gonna better ourselves, how we're gonna better our family. So I think now the, the, the movimiento has moved to, um, supporting and ensuring rights for DACA students, you know, students that are born here. Absolutely, and, and I'm glad that you pointed out, that out because I feel that as the, as the population that was once um, um, Latinx, the majority Latinx population in the US at some point was Mexican, right? And so uh, now we see that, that many, that population is transforming. And so more issues that are, that are more inclusive of different different communities, unique histories of migration are, are beginning to, to take center stage. And I think that, that, well, I guess I would like to hear what you all think in terms of the new directions that are being brought um, by, by students, like you said, undocumented students, undocumented queer students, indigenous students that are also migrating from Latin American countries. Vicky, it looks like you have your hand up. I want to go to your original question about another organization that was forming in 1960. Am I muted? Or, or, I'm no, okay. no, we could. In 1965, the first uh, chapter of the Association of Mexican American Educators was formed, and these were LAUSD based, sort of, but it, it included Richard Alatore, Marcus de Leon who was considered the founder of bilingual education and uh, Frank Armendares and quite a few others because of the lack of Chicanos or at that time, Mexican-American teachers, administrators. Uh, we just did not uh, ex exist in the district. And that, that organization lives today, but not as quite as powerful because many of the achievements have been uh, um, overcome a little. In fact, when you approach uh, uh, young uh, Latino uh, Latinx teachers today, there, there's no, there was no struggle to become a teacher. There was no struggle to become an administrator. When uh, I worked at Hollenbeck Middle School, uh, Hollenbeck Junior High as a teacher, among only two other Mexican American teachers when I started, and that you know, and th that organization once grew to 40 chapters in the state of California and uh, led uh, the, the celebration, Dia de los Maestros now, was pushed as legislation by AME. There's a lot of, uh, so I always think that's a, a, a organization that was uh, 
occurring and um, and many of our own personal accomplishments I owe to Ami. Well, I agree with Vicki. My parents were East LA school teachers, but they were rare. My dad was the only Mexican American teacher at that junior high in Maravilla you know, when he joined. And uh, that was my role model. I did all my student teaching at East LA schools and observation, Garfield, Lincoln, Wilson had a master's and a teaching credential. And I was turned down by the LA city schools in 1967. And also I interviewed as far north as Santa Barbara and as far south as San Diego. And I only got one offer from Pomona and that was it. Now the next year there's the walkouts and the same districts that hadn't even given me, you know, much more than an application to fill out, were saying that they couldn't find anybody qualified. So mm. they, this was, uh, you know, this was a battle to get hired, and then to get retained. I was glad that when La Vida Nueva got going, they were uh, East LA College. They were going to hire a journalism teacher for it. I applied again. I had the credential for junior college. I had the master's in journalism, and I'd been working with Chicano Media. Mm -hmm. I got the interview and that was it, no job. Uh, now for organizations that have been overlooked, I would put in top of my list, the Mexican American movement, which was founded and incorporated in 1942 in Southern California. It was an outgrowth of the, the YMCA, Mexican Youth Conference. Uh, you know, it got ran into World War II, where a lot of their members went, but there was an activist organization that went well into the 50s their motto was progress through education. The same motto we had that Oscar had for the community day on campus at the bottom of our posters. And then they were a way where people could get together. They may have been the only and the lonely teacher or uh, administrator or wherever they worked, but they got together and they had scholarships and community activities and such. And I think somebody should do more on them than uh, has been done. Oscar? Alejandro, as a historian here, let, let me um, say that um, it's important for students to um, look at our Mexican past, to look at Mexico, be, be, because as, as a people, um, we, uh, our experience is a continuation of a long experience that, that began uh, in, in Mexico with the indigenous groups of of, of Mexico. And, and, and so over the course of history, for centuries, there have been many important uh, chapters in that history that demonstrate to us the resolve of our ancestors in, in, uh, in struggling and, and resisting oppression. And you can begin with the resistance against the Spaniards, the Europeans who came into Mexico and, and conquered Mexico and imposed a, a colonial system. And you look at those 300 years of colonialism in Mexico and you can find movements of resistance throughout that, uh, throughout that period. Uh, one closer to where we are physically is the Pueblo Revolt of 1680, which uh, really was, was a very impressive revolt that was carried on by, by the indigenous people uh, the Pueblos of, of New Mexico. But then you just go forward in time and, and you, um, you need to recognize uh, great achievements of uh, people who were activists and who were really interested in improving the conditions of, of the people. The uh, independence of Mexico movement that happened in the 1810s. In a couple of days, Mexico will celebrate on the 16th of September, celebrate the anniversary of the independence of Mexico. And that's uh, 200 years. It's a very important anniversary, anniversary that's, uh, that's coming up. And so there's, there's great, uh, there are great stories and, and great people who did heroic things that, that one can admire. They're part of our people. They're part of our, our heritage. You take it forward, and one of the biggest events in Mexican history is the Mexican Revolution. And both the independence movement in Mexico had a northern frontier or a borderlands component to it. 
and the Mexican Revolution, a lot of it was fought in northern Mexico and along the border. And a lot of binational, bicultural people were involved in the Mexican Revolution. It's one of the great social movements of the 20th century. So what I would encourage students to, to do is to connect all these things and to understand and be proud of uh, these uh, things that have happened in the past that, that have paved the way for the things that uh, have been done in the Southwestern United States by the Mexican American population. One organization that's very important in our, in our history in the Southwest is the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC. And there are other organizations like that, the Mexican American the GI Forum, uh, for, for example, and all the activism of the veterans of the uh, World War II period who came back and, and really fought some very important battles that set the stage for the advances that we experienced in the 1950s. And then by the 1960s, this is very important, by the 1960s, we had a situation uh, in our community where enough of the Mexican American community had been educated and had become um, middle class and had established contact with other groups in the country and, and alliances and coalitions and so forth that had not been present before. So there had been a lot of movements, but they were localized and they were regional. But in the 1960s, for the first time, we have the opportunity to link up with a national movement involved in civil rights and, and, the, and the movement against the Vietnam War and, and, and so forth. So you see the continuity of all these things. And, and I think every, every Mexican American student needs to take Mexica, Mexican history, history of Mexico, and it's important to connect all these very important dots. Thank you. Yes, that's an amazing summary. Great. Thank you for doing that. I mean, I think that's um, um, one of the one of the things that I feel um, the Chicano movement has been critiqued on. Right? Is this this use of of iconography that's indigenous? Right? Um, and I know that that kind of served for many folks as a, a call for for like a collective identity. It, it served like like you said, it was a, an example of resistance. But now as we start to see this, um, the changing demographics of the uh, migrating people, for instance, we see a lot of um, indigenous people um, who migrate from the countries of origin that many of us come from, but don't identify as uh, Mexican nationals, for example, or Guatemalan nationals, right? So you have like um, indigenous Mayans, indigenous Pulepecha, indigenous Zapotec people who are now my students. And now my students themselves who are also CLS majors are coming and saying, um, well, I, I know what the struggle did, but the struggle needs to change to accommodate for where we're at today. What are your thoughts on these new critiques and uh, what new directions should the movimiento of today um, consider? Well, you don't build a movement by keeping people out. So people who want to identify with you or want to be part of what you're doing, you need to be part of what they're doing and what their agenda is. And, uh, you know, we, the UMAS was very uh, male centric uh, in terms of the leadership, not in terms of who was doing a lot of the heavy lifting uh, because that reflected the period. And then it became more inclusive of, of women and more reflective, more sexual orientation of these issues. So you build a movement by including people. Where do we stand together? What do we cooperate? We may not agree on every issue, even what to call ourselves, what our names are, but uh, you know, we can join forces here, we can join forces there. And out of that collective action, which is based on individual decisions, individual choices that people make, you can build a larger, a larger movement. So I think people who say they're part of a movement, but uh, you can't be part of it, or that's not part of what we want to do or whatever, you know, you build by bringing people in, not by keeping them out. That's great. Thank you. Um, let, let me um, throw in another question, and you could jump onto this one, too. Um, the most prominent struggles of the day today are Black Lives Matter, the Undocu queer movement, 
and indigenous critiques of coloniality, which are all seem to be calling for an abolitionist approach to policing and surveillance, uh, such as the recent uh, demands for uh, dismantling or defunding police and ICE. Um, what are your thoughts about how the movimiento can or should or should it not embrace this this abolitionist perspective? Alejandro, we we've, we've been fighting that battle since the founding of Los Angeles with the police and the sheriffs and whoever they were. I mean, you know, from lynchings to incarcerations to uh, I mean that is an ongoing struggle, not only in the Chicano communities, but in, in, in uh, communities of color and poor communities. I'm glad you said that. I too see it as a continuity of that struggle. And, and I think Smiley himself shared how his own cousin had been shot in the back. And so um, how many of us have had these experiences with law enforcement or ICE or any other type of institution such as that, that that has contributed to our participation. Smiley, you want to share? Or your uncle. Um, Monte, um, I know you raised your hand and I think I just um, put you in as a panelist. So I'm hoping that you could, hey, there you go, Monte Perez. Thank you for joining. Well, um, you want to share some thoughts um, about it, either of these questions? Uh, yeah, the, the first one had to do with, um other peoples, indigenous and others that are coming into the fold. And uh, I have to admit that back in 1969, I had a conversation with two or three activists who are Guatemalan and Central American. And they said, why is Chicanos just Mexican? And I said, it's not, it's political. It's a social movement. It's an economic justice movement. We're all part of this movement. And I still believe that today. Uh, and so I think it's more, as Felix said, we have to understand everybody's where they're coming, but we're all part of social economic self-determination. That's what the Chicano movement was about, self-determination. We're gonna call ourselves what we want and we're gonna get what we need for our community. And that's what motivated me back then. So I, that's what I wanted to answer. And I think we can tell our students, you are part of the movement. It is all part of the movement. So I wanted to say that. And um, uh, the other stuff, I think Teresa, Terry has uh, good thoughts about that. This, my dad told me when I was 10 years old, don't talk to policemen, <laughs> they'll beat the hell out of you. So, and he grew up in LA. So, you know, he, he warned me about that aspect of LA life. Anyway, I just wanted to say that. Good to see you all. Thank you, Monte. And, and I think that's especially powerful coming from you all as um, people who are recognized as elders and, and foundational to the movement of the 60s. Because I think, I think current students, um, because some other folks didn't interpret it the way that you did, um, don't feel, see themselves in, this, in these efforts. And so for you to invite them in this way, I think is, is, is the way we close that these generational gaps about what is a Chicano or, or what type of political identities we wanna create or, or movements, right? Uh, Alejandro, I also wanted to add, you know, and when you talk about defunding the police, you then have to say, well, those funds could be used to cancel student debt. They could be used to give services to the homeless. They could be used to provide Medicare for all because then it's making sense of why you want that, why you're, you're supporting that. Yeah. yeah, thank you. One of the things that I kept hearing from all of you is this, this focus on education, how important education was, right? And, and I've always heard education is the great equalizer, right? But today, today in, in the US, we still have less than 10% of people of Mexican ancestry who get a BA, right? And so, um, while I recognize that education is, is a, a big equalizer, I also understand that we don't all have access to it. And so how, how, do we, how do we continue to fight for equity when the educational systems haven't been available to, to all of us, right? From my perspective and the different roles I've had, the struggle continues. 
you can go back to the demands of the walkout. I remember sitting there as board president and listening to students with the same issue. No one's encouraging me. Nobody's, uh, uh, you know, uh, giving me access to the appropriate classes. I'm still being uh, forced out. And uh, it, 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 the struggle remains. Uh, the coloring of our uh, teaching force, our administrators might help, but the fundamental needs of students of poverty, of struggle are there. And it's, you've got to be there and um you know and 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 uh, as you were talking about the you know eliminating the police i went through the movement with a cousin that is a sheriff that became the east l.a captain of the sheriff so somehow we lived uh together and we had our differences may big differences but bottom line he came from the same struggle the same uh challenges and i would have to remind him who helped you and uh you know Force is just not the only way. There's a proper role for it. But if you look at education today and you look at the demands of the walkouts, I would say other than the food items, uh, there are still many things that uh, that, that are, are, are basic needs within our school. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I like emphasizing that this is ongoing, right? It, it's, it doesn't end. And I, I feel like your, your own parents um handed you the baton and the responsibility for for change and now you've handed it to us and to our students and so um i i, I appreciate that you continue to to struggle in, in ways like through ame um through your own um um scholarship and and activism i know that terry was at the moratorium last year and this year and, and so i know that you are still out there um uh, so thank you very much for that. I, I, I want to change. I want to transfer it over to our next section. Um, uh, at this point, David is going to um, kind of take us in a new direction. So David, as our MC, thank you all. Thank you, Alejandro. Thank you, Profe. Um, okay, folks. So it is currently seven thirty-one p.m. Uh, it's now time for our Q and A section of our panel today. Uh, I'd like to now introduce to all of you our facilitator of the Q&A section and student at Cal State LA, Cristina Cortez. Cristina, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for that. So we do have three questions. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start off with the first. This is from Dan Dominguez and he is asking, what were the most effective ways to approach economic justice and economic democracy in Chicanx spaces for you? Oh, that's a big one. Hmm. Yeah, well, you know, this is one of the big uh, problems that, that we have, not only in the United States, but in the country, economic inequality, economic inequality. There's too much power in the, in the hands of uh, corporations in, in the United States. And uh, I was uh, greatly encouraged by the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement that uh, developed uh, some years ago, but greatly disappointed that it uh, petered out. It petered out. And, and that's uh, what, what we need. We need uh, a lot more activism in the US uh, focused on the issue of uh, fighting this uh, wealth inequality that, that we have in this country. If you look at the statistics of um, wealth distribution in the United States, you, you, you see that in the last several decades, those at the very top have accumulated a lot of wealth Many billionaires, um, there were many billionaires th that uh, uh, accumulated their wealth as a result of um, not only the uh, economic conditions that favored, favored them, but also the policies of, uh, of the government and conservative Republican run governments that kept giving uh, tax cuts 
uh, slashing regulations and, and and making it easy for those who had wealth and 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 making it hard for people at at the bottom so the saying that uh, the rich got richer and the then the poor got poorer is is really true so what's our responsibility well realistically we and, 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 and to be honest, we don't have much of a movement in, in the Mexican American population at the present time. Uh, and somehow, somehow we, we need to revive that, what we had in the 1960s and identify those issues that are particularly significant because our population is uh, one of the groups that is down at the bottom. And some of us are lucky to be part of the middle class, but the middle class in our community is, is rather small. And so this is, this is a battle that needs to be fought in the United States. And we need to uh, get engaged in this movement and form alliances and coalitions with other groups that are fighting it. Um, because otherwise the system is in place to keep the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. Thank you for that, Mr. Martinez. Now we will move on to our next question. Um, and this is for anyone to answer. How did you keep motivated in the movement? How did having children, if there were any children, change your perspective or approach to be a participant on the movimiento? I personally allowed fear to keep me from being an activist and my children becoming a target. Well, I think you, you stay committed to the causes that you are a part of. You can adapt to your life situation. You know, when you have a, a degree, you have other avenues that you can ex exist. You don't give up your commitment, but you can exercise it in other ways. You want to make a better life for your children as best you can, both at home and in the society. And, uh, and you know, cause really you're doing this not so much for individuals, but for the larger society and for your own, your own, uh, your own children, the other members of your family. So I think it's a, it's a choice by choice um, uh, endeavor. I think at the beginning, going back to 67, 68, we wanted to be part of everything. So they're having this march for welfare rights. Okay, well, we'll be there. We're gonna be a police brutality. Okay, well, we'll be there or, you know, whatever, labor, union, you know. And I think as, as it got bigger and more people got in, then you say, well, I can do this or I can't do that. Or this one, I have to, you know, take care of things. I have other responsibilities that, that I have. It doesn't mean that you check out, I think it means that you become more focused and say, really, where can I make a difference? Uh, for me, I stayed involved with media, but when they got to be more Chicano reporters or some Chicano reporters, then I worked with the California Chicano News Media Association because there was enough to have a, an organization that had been formed uh, before I got there and when I was at uh, graduate school. And so, okay, well, well, we'll have conferences, we'll do programs, we'll encourage young people, we'll give scholarships. We do those kinds of things. So things evolve in ways where you reflect your commitment through your activism. And, you know, I could do things as a professor that I couldn't do when I was a student. And I didn't leave that behind. I just had other avenues that could go on. And I've seen here Monte, you know, as the president of a college, you have Vicky who's uh, been on the school board and um, Oscar who's written more books than uh, most professors I know and is still writing them. You know, these, we all came out of Cal State LA UPAS. You know, I, I, I what think brought us need, together then is, yeah. is what keeps us going now. Yeah, I, I, what I always try to embed in students or teachers or people that I work with is that we are people of struggle. And no matter what level you achieve, you're still struggling and go back and assist, open doors, continue. It, it, you know, you, you achieve being a teacher, you achieve being a principal, you, whatever. The struggle is not over. It's just giving you a different uh, platform to advocate 
And so uh, I think if you grew up of struggle, you'll be a person of struggle and assisting others always. Well, that's the only way we improve and uh, our, our community. And don't ever think you just got there because you were so brilliant and talented on your own. That, that was my biggest uh, trouble with uh, some of my teachers, but I was a regular admit. I didn't need this, I didn't need that. Sweetheart, somebody opened the door for you and you need to open the, the door for others, was my line. That was, that was the role model I had from my parents. They, you know, they were met as activists. They became teachers, and they were very active in the community. My mother became a counselor. She'd gotten a psychometrist credential in the 50s, early 50s. And then when this federal program started in the 60s, they moved from the kindergarten teaching of Rowan Avenue to Belvedere Elementary to give IQ tests, which they were giving in English to kids who just gotten there from Mexico. So she translated the tests into Spanish. And kids who they tested into mentally retarded or whatever they called it in those days, you know, that's not where they belonged. And then she would give them the test, you know, after they'd been assigned there to test them out and met great resistance from the principals and some of the teachers because they, you know, they got more funding for having kids that qualified for extra help. So you use where your position, where you are to make a difference in the things that have always been important to you. Okay. I think following up on, on both Vicky's comments and, and uh, Felix's comments is that when uh, you have children, you have an even greater reason to resolve the inequities that your parents went, had or that you had. And it opens other areas of struggle. It opens, for example, being a parent also means being a parent to a ch child that goes to school and all of the things that that school needs to do with those children. How are, how are they education? How are they educating my child? How are they, what is their curriculum as far as Chicano studies? Um, so that is one of, you know, that just opens more areas. You don't have to withdraw. It's true that they require time and it's important to give them time. But that time can be quality time, you know, I mean, at parent-teacher conferences. And the more people know that know of things that are happening, the more protected you are. Uh, the more uh, I let people know the struggle I'm in, and the more people know, the more protected I am. Because if, you, if the fewer people know, then there are fewer people that can come to your aid if you are uh, put under pressure or attacked by forces uh, that exist. Thank you. Um, and we have one more question here from Tony Quesada. They are asking, how do you think we should continue to push the movement to the younger generation? I think uh, for, for young people who are interested in um, helping the community, I, I, I think the first step is to become informed of what the needs of the community are and, and, and uh, to identify where the needs are, whether it's in education, in housing, delivery of services to people, uh, food insecurity, there's so many issues in communities and, and to volunteer, volunteer in, with some of these uh, organizations that are helping people in the community. You become more informed of the needs and you become more informed of why these problems exist. And in the process, you meet people from th these communities who have an understanding of uh, who controls who controls the resources of the community? How are these resources distributed? And the the the, the more you become informed, the, the the more outraged you you get at the um, at the inequalities and 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 also in the in the way that some sectors of the population have excessive control over the way that uh, 
resources are, are, are distributed and the way that they are consumed. Anyway, that's, that's an education that you're not gonna get in school, but uh, you can easily, if, if, you, if you want to devote the time, you can easily get it in the community by going out and volunteering for some of these things. And then I, in the process, you identify other people who share those values and wanna get involved. And pretty soon you may form an organization <laughs> that, that, that is focused on improving conditions in, in your community. And who knows, eventually you can build a movement. I have seen this, I have seen how these things uh, work. And I, I have admired uh, people who, who, who begin this way and be, before long they have recruited other uh, like-minded uh, people to, to, to join the cause. And pretty soon they have an organization and that are organizations like that often become very influential in communities. I have seen this in Tucson, Arizona. I saw it in East LA, of course. That's where it's been, where I spent many years. Um, and I've seen it here in El Paso. And lately I've been involved in some of these things uh, here in, in El Paso. And, and it's, it's, so th these, these are isolated efforts. They're not connected to, to bigger efforts. It's, it's, it's a movement uh, that um, it, it would be nice to connect these things and try to build a larger movement that could uh, revive um, some, of the, some of the activity, some of the excitement that we had back in the 1960s. It was, it was very inspiring and I, I am hopeful that uh, we can replicate that again because the, actually the challenges are, are, are harder or are bigger now. I mentioned the wealth inequality is a big, big issue. The other thing that is, is, is uh, really um, a, a tremendous challenge is that our democracy can disappear if we're not careful, if the US government, the Senate in particular, doesn't pass this legislation that is meant to um, overcome what the Republicans have been doing in many states in the area of voter, voter suppression, the, if, if those uh, bills don't pass, then we're gonna have uh, a system that the Republicans have put together to be in control as a minority, to be in control of, of our lives. And the Republicans are bad, bad news for the Chicano and Chicana community. So that's a big challenge. Yes, I just want to remind, you know, all the young people on the, on the Zoom that in California, you can register at the age of 16. You can't vote until you're 18, but you can register at the age of 16. So all of you young people, anybody you know that's 16, you ought to register them because we're the fastest growing minority and also the fastest growing voting bloc in the United States. It is, you, you can't be president without the black, Latino and white vote. If you don't have all three of those, you can't be president. So we are determinant in many things. And I think we'll see tonight and as in the returns come in, how important it is. And I, I hope you, I hope, I, I know that um, Vicki and all of us, I think, have been involved in the struggles uh, that come through uh, the electoral process. It is not the only process. It is only one of many, but it is, it is a very important one that people have died for and don't throw it away get people, register yourselves to vote and get people to vote and fight so that people can have the right to vote, like the DACA. Thank you for sharing these important messages with us. And um, I believe we're going to move on to the next section, but I did want to share something that a student from Roosevelt wrote. Um, her name is Ashley and she put that she has really enjoyed learning about the Chicano history and how, to, how it affects us now. She says that she appreciates all of you taking your time 
uh, for educating her and inspiring her to learn more about the subject that is so important in her community and to her identity. So thank you. Thank you. I want, I want to add, I'm a rough writer for life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you so much, Christina, uh, for facilitating the Q&A section. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Rafael Solorzano of Cal State LA, who will be today's honorary discussant. Dr. Solorzano, how do tonight's testimonials connect to give us a better understanding, not only of the origins of CLS, but the necessary new directions of the Movimiento? Thank you so much, David. Um, first and foremost, I am honored to be here. I'm honored to have listened to everybody's testimonials. And I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit nervous um, to share what I have to say, but I have been so much inspired. Um, first, I, I, I just want to say that, you know, El Grito series is indeed a living and thriving archive. And that is what I'm seeing here today, as all of you have been sharing your testimonials. And I believe that this series, and I'll speak about the series, and then I'll talk about how what all of you have said provide some new directions in, in, in Chicanx Latinx studies, but also in how we write social movements. From what place do we write social movement history from? But I feel the Grito series is making what used to be these hidden labors of resistance visible. Right? I love these, I love these series because it really highlights these hidden labors of resistance within the field of Chicana, Chicano, Chicanx studies. The, the series and the intergenerational platicas like the one today calls attention um, to the major organizing collectives and individuals during that time and a specific place in space. As we have seen specifically that of college age youth, um, women whose tactics, subversive ideas, rebellious plans and dangerous thoughts and which some have called hallway movidas shaped the Chicana Chicano movement in radical ways. Again, I want to give you props to the Crip Collective for producing the Grito series. Your efforts and your episodes make us rethink the history of El Movimiento by us having to engender history, right? Place gender at the center. And by placing gender at the center, um, we place Chicana agency trans to be transformative. And one thing I want to say about, you know, the work that, that I see here and perhaps something I can share a little bit about myself is I, I'm, I consider myself a social movement historian. I specifically look at the emerging Chicana X and Latin X movimientos in the US South. I spent time out there um, with our compañeras, our compañeros, um, um, con papeles and sin papeles who are fighting in Atlanta, Georgia, who are fighting in South Florida and who are actually getting the vote out in North Carolina and who in many ways, and I just wanna give them a shout out here today, um, helped us with the presidency, right? And continue to shape new politics and emerging radical politics in, in places like Georgia by getting out the vote. And I say this because I, I definitely believe that, that we have to start thinking about different places to do our history, right? And so, also, I would like to start off by saying that today's Grito series allows us to recognize that place matters in Chicana X history. And like the barrio, Cal State LA is a central place in Chicana X history. Also, I wanna share how the series allows us um, to see the advantages of when we zoom in and we zoom out of a specific place like Cal State LA. I hope today's counter stories allowed us to see how a place like Cal State LA and East LA have a lived history have a mean, meaningful story, a subversive story, where subversive ideas such as stopping the war in Vietnam, which at that time was a dangerous talk, was taking place in the East Side. In the case of all our speakers, we hear how they were shaped by their mothers, their fathers, teachings, such as how they learned to mobilize voters, how they saw that in their household, and how they saw that their parents were engaging workers, right, were part of the labor movement, and also that their parents instilled in them the importance of education. But also when we zoom in, 
We hear what brought young Chicanas and Chicanos together at Cal State LA under Umas and then Mecha. And what were their issues that was close to their hearts? What mobilized their corazones and their rebellious plans within the university you know, in the 60s and 70s? Zooming in, we hear the stories like that of Teresa Gonzalez and where she shares the multiracial alliance building at Cal State LA, which speaks to the moments and movements in which black and brown and Asians challenge campus power imbalances and forge new solidarities at Cal State LA. But also I think that it's important for us to think about our history relationally. And this is something that my colega Alejandro mentioned about how he remembers when Teresa was talking about um, her experience, experience listening to Fidel at a young age, right? But then Alejandro makes the connection of how uh, Chicanas and Chicanos of the 90s were waiting for Subcomandantes Comuniques to come out, right? To like, what is our next move? I say this because I think that we need to start thinking about our social movements um, relationally. We need to begin to zoom out, right? Zoom in and zoom out. So many of the today's stories help us zoom out, help us place the Chicano and Chicano movement in relation to other movimientos outside the United States. Your testimonios of having parents who were labor leaders, who were anti-imperialists, who were anti-capitalists, and educators reminded us the importance um, that the movimiento was internationalist and multiracial as it was nationalist and ethnic based. It reminds me of the work of Alan Aladio Gomez's book, The Revolutionary Imagination of Greater Mexico that makes that argument. Again, when we zoom out, when we zoom out, the arc of civil rights not only came from the deep South, but it also came from the global South. I too would echo what Prophet Oscar Martinez mentioned about the need to look beyond the US to understand our local. And I would like to end my, my, you know, my little um, contribution by quoting a colega, a Chicana ex historian, Felipe Hinayosa from Texas, who documents the Latino radical politics and church occupations in the barrio, specifically like the one in East LA. He states, telling these stories reinforces once again that the power of the Chicana Chicano freedom movements resides in local spaces and neighborhood struggles where the ideas for social and political liberation are firmly planted. Again, thank you for the Grito series for making this happen. Gracias. Thank you, Prof. Raja, for that brilliant discussion. Um, we appreciate you. Um, First of all, I am truly honored to have emceed this event amongst so many historical figures, and I will always cherish this moment. Um, but before I close off, um, I'd like to invite our panelists to share any last remarks. Yeah, I'll say, get involved in politics. Politics at this moment is extremely important. I would say, believe in the First Amendment, freedom of expression, the reason we were able to build a movimiento is because people who were feeling something inside started expressing it, whether it was through teatros, whether it was through the press, whether it was speeches, rallies, and all that. And you find out there are others who feel the way you do. And then you gather together. And now you have so many other ways, digitally and otherwise, making videos and you know YouTube and all that stuff to get the word out. So don't wait till somebody gives you permission to talk get out there and express yourself however you want to, poetry or, or theater or anything, you know, posting, uh, get it out. You'll find somebody who listens and you'll find somebody has something in common with. That's how you build a movimiento, one at a time. Um, I just get out the vote, like Smiley said, register people at 16, um, ensure that people are voting and then hold your elected officials accountable for of whatever social justice um, you want to, to see in your community. Just be a person that addresses any struggle you see. If you see it uh, on your, uh, you see something's not right, speak up and make it be a, be a change maker. That's all it is. It can be a large, uh, big issue, it can be a small issue. Just don't be silent. There is no reason and it's unconscionable 
that anybody should not have the rights that anybody else does. And those rights begin with having a place to live, having a good job, having decent wages, a place to eat, and to have a family that is safe, regardless of how that family is structured. Get out there and get active. All right, thank you all so much. We're gonna take a picture. Profe Rafa is gonna take it. So please, if you could all um, turn on your camera and show your brilliant smiles before we get going. Smiley especially. <laughs> <laughs> Ready, Rafa? Yes, everybody ready? Yes, sir. Okay, Dalia? Okay, here we go. One, two, three. Look good. Gracias. David. Folks, that will conclude today's uh, powerful episode. First and foremost, we want to give a special thank you to all of uh, the guests today for sharing their experience along with their powerful wisdom and knowledge. Oscar Martinez, Felix Gutierrez, Ismael Parra, Teresa Gonzalez, Victoria Castro, and Monte Perez. On behalf of the Chicana and Latina uh, Studies Department at Cal State LA and all guests watching, want to thank you for your inspirational words. Thank you. We'd also like to uh, thank Dr. Rafa Solorzano and Dr. Alejandro Covarrubias for today's wonderful discussion. Thank you to all members of the Crypt Collective, Dalia Carmona, Cristina Cortez, Erandi Colin, Ricardo Nunez, Jesse Jimenez, Diana Ponce, Pedro Reyes, and Victor Orgel for their assistance in producing and promoting this event. And we want to extend our gratitude to all the virtual guests joining us today on this very special occasion. We'd like to remind everyone that this is an ongoing series of multiple episodes. Please follow us on Instagram at Grito Series where we will keep everyone updated on future events. If anyone would like to send a special message or letter to any of our guests today, please send it to gritoseries at gmail.com and we'll ensure that they receive your letter. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all. Have a great evening and we'll be in touch. We're gonna share this live, so be on the lookout for it. Okay, thank you. Viva la raza. All power to the people. Uh, now we got power the election people. results. Well, it's eight o'clock. Let's see how we eight did. Eight o'clock, the election results. Se puede, si se puede. Se puede. Gracias, gracias a todos. Thank you for inviting us and keep going. Siempre adelante. And good seeing you, Felix Monte. I see Ismaili and Teresa and Oscar. I can't. Years, years. It was yeah. brilliant. Ditto, ditto on that with Vicky. Good to see you, Monte. Good to 